going to be talking about how to use a grant scorecard to create winning proposals. I love grants. I used to love grant writing. I love reviewing them. And I love the grant scorecard. So I'm excited about what we're going to learn today. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. I'm going to show you how you can engage because you're here to learn about the grant scorecard. Everybody's on mute. You already turned on the closed caption. But if you do need closed caption, just look at the bottom of your screen and hit the CC button. We are going to send you the video and the slides by later today if Zoom acts right. And I know they will. So check your email box for that. There's going to be a survey. I know some of you have to leave early. may leave like a minute before we end. There's going to be a survey that pops up. Please um, let us know. It's just two questions. And I'm going to move this out of the way and turn you over to the wonderful Alice Runke. She is the president of Grant Station. So much wisdom, so much knowledge. So like how often do you get a president of an organization come speak to you? So Alice, over to you. Have a great webinar. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, Aretha, yep, there we go. I will go ahead and start sharing my screen as well. Uh, but I'm really excited to have such a large crowd here today and um, people who are, um, like Aretha said, us, us grant professionals in the field, it's not an easy job. Um, I totally understand that. I, I came from a grant writing background. Um, and so just to kind of share how this particular webinar came about was just that every other year at Grant Station, we do a winning grant proposal competition. And so if over the last two years you wrote a, a grant that was awarded, you can submit your grant to us and compete for different prizes and things like that. And so I joined Grant Station as the president two years ago. And when I did, um, that was one of my duties was to, to work on the winning grant proposal competition. So uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do as we were doing that evaluation of all of these incredible proposals, right, they were all winning proposals, um, was to create a better scorecard of how the, the guest reviewers were going to evaluate them. And to kind of get more into the details and more into the weeds so that people had a better kind of understanding of how to judge them. And so, you know, what I had found was before that the, the questions were rather, you know, a little more generic, like, is there enough need or is the work plan sufficient, you know, kind of generalities. And I was like, let's dig deeper into the really good components of each section of a proposal and be able to better score the applications. So that's where this entire webinar came from. We created a new scoring rubric and that's what we're going to talk about today and how we can take the different sections of a grant application, how we can take work that we've previously done or use it um, to evaluate work we're currently doing to really drill down into, do we have these components? If we added these, would it make our proposal stronger? So we're gonna walk through each of those different components of the application um, and talk about you know, what can make those sections strong and weak and what you can do uh, to enhance your, the different sections of a proposal if you find that your scores are a little weak. And then the other thing that I just find that is the hardest thing about grant writing or the thing that makes it really confusing is the terms that funders use. So every funder uses a different title, uses a different um, word, uh, and yet all these different terms generally mean the same things. Um, so like if we looked at 10 funders um, application instructions, it would really look like we have to write 10 different grant applications. But once you can kind of train your own process to really understand how these funders are using that term, your the 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 terms in their um in their instructions, then you're going to be it's going to be easier for you to translate from one application to another. So we'll also talk about those synonymous terms. And then we'll have time for question and answers. So we do have a large group. So if you just want to go ahead, you can pop them right in the Q&A as we're going along. If you have any questions, um, Aretha can answer questions in the background. Jeremy can also answer questions in the background. Uh, but we will have time at the end. 
So one other thing I do want to tell you that we are having our annual TechSoup um, promotion and it's twice a year. And on September 17th and 18th, you can get a uh, grand station for $99 through TechSoup. It only happens twice a year um, for two days each. So just kind of keep that in mind if you're looking for a grand station membership, because that's the best deal you're going to get. All right, so let's get into the, the details on this. So we usually have a section in an application. I'm calling it an organizational background, but it's where you're really establishing your credibility as an organization that gets things done. And so what you'll see as we walk through each one, kind of this scorecard of where the different components, what makes it strong, and then that kind of graduation down to being, you know, a weaker background section, organizational background section. So kind of, again, you can just, I'm not gonna read through these word for word, but really kind of understanding that, that, that funders are usually looking for your success in providing the services that you're going to be um, uh, proposing in your grant application. Um, they really want to see you as a strong and viable organization that gets things done, and they can see that through your organizational background section, seeing your successes, seeing what you've changed in the community, um, seeing, you know, what your mission is and, and what it is that you address. Um, so again, that very, very strong application would show that, that previous success and demonstrate your organization's strengths. And kind of going all the way down to kind of the weaker side of not being able to see um, that you have the track record with the target population or the area that you're addressing. Um, sometimes we expand our programs, right? But if we can at least show that we've served the target population or served the community in the past with success, you know, th those are things that you'd want to weave into your application to show them that you do indeed have that track record with the target population. And then one other kind of little anecdotal story, but um, I was writing a big federal grant. Um, now this is like 20 years ago, but at the time it was a very, very competitive federal grant. And at the time, we didn't have a super strong background and track record of providing, it was for capacity building. And we we had some success, but we didn't have a lot of documented success. And so we actually decided as an organization, we were like, we're gonna take this entire year, we're gonna build up, get those um, you know evaluation components, really be able to show what we've done in this field with these folks that we're trying to serve. Um, and, you know, we took that whole year instead to really build our own ability to tell that story. Um, and then we actually were awarded one of those grants. So, again, really kind of an important component that, that the funders can really see that, that you've had that track record. And then just, again, synonymous terms, you know, just one funder is going to call it the organizational background and another funder is going to call it um, profile of the applicant organization and another funder is going to say it organizational history mission and accomplishments you know again all using those different terms but there's going to be a section where you're establishing your credibility as an organization you're going to call it what they call it um, but you can then translate that from one um, application to the next so let's kind of look at a few ways with that background section of, of tangible things that you can do if you're looking at your background section and you're feeling like um, it needs some improvement. Um, so one of the things is just really making sure that you are really aligned with the funder and what the funder you know, is, is, is trying to change in their own world, right? So funders are nonprofits, um, just like we are as, as nonprofit organizations, and they have the money to address certain certain areas that 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 means something to them. And we're the as the nonprofits, we're the people on the ground, boots on the ground, we're their vehicles for actually creating that change. Um, so it's always really, really important to make sure that you have, you know really outline that alignment with the funder in your background, how you, again, are similar. And um, with just as an example from the GrantStation database, you know, we have um, 
profiles of each of our funders in there. And it really talks about, you know, what areas they're looking to fund. And then, you know, you would want to make sure that if you were writing an animal welfare um, proposal right here, that you're really showing your, uh, the work you've done in animal welfare and how you really match um, the vision of the Benson Cooper Fund um, and those sorts of things. So again, making that good alignment, and you can do that from the very beginning of your research process of figuring out which funders you want to pursue. Um, a second kind of uh, catch-all slide here is to just understand the funder. Um, that it is also part of your research when you're determining, you know, which opportunity is going to be your best return on investment. Um, but there's lots of um, ability to go and look at what a funder funded in the past through their tax forms, their 990 tax forms. There's ways to look at their annual reports and kind of see how they are, like with the example of animal welfare, what part of animal welfare do they really seem interested in, in funding and those sorts of things. So again, doing that research and really understanding them is gonna help you again, first decide. And then second, once you've decided that they're a good prospect, then it you can write to them, you know, sharing how you guys share this passion or this vision. Um, really being able, like I was saying earlier, to demonstrate that you've had an impact in whatever you've done in the past, being able to show that People have changed, the community has changed, whatever kind of area it is you're working with, and really defining that with, you know, some data of what you've done in the past and how you've made, um, you know, a difference in people's lives and things like that. And then really, you just, you really want to um, highlight your organization's strengths. It's really your time to brag about those components of your organization that make you really strong, really unique, um, and you know, making sure that all that information is weaved into the story in the background so that they can really see, again, how strong you are as an organization. And then these two last uh, bullets really talk a little bit more about what I was talking about with not having that experience with the target population, you know, you or uh, the community or the, the area of interest that you're serving. Um, and so usually it's much harder to get a grant saying, you know, if I build this program, they will come um, because a funder kind of wants to see that you have a track record. Right. So even if you've done and this happened to me a lot with uh, smaller organizations that did a lot of work in the community on a, a volunteer kind of ad hoc uh, system until they got, you know, their successes, they got things and then they were starting to say, OK, now I want to look at grant funding again. I was always weaving those stories, even if they had never uh, you know, received grant funds before, that past track record and those past successes, I want to be able to demonstrate to that funder, right, that, that this organization has been doing the work, um, even though they've been doing it without any, you know, particular grant funding in the past. Um, so again, these are things that you really want to either uh, make sure that you've really strengthened in your applications, or if you don't have these things that you're starting that process of collecting this information so that you can in the future, weave those strengths, weave those outcomes, weave the change you've made into your applications. Okay, so that's an organizational background section. We're gonna move next to the need statement. So a couple of things that I want to talk through with the need statement, I like when I get little claps, that's kind of fun, um, is um, just some different components as to, you know, how you really make that impactful need statement. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can get local data. We want our data to be as local to the population that we're serving as possible. So if you're serving, you know, one county, you want to have countywide data. Um, for let's say you work with youth dropping out of school, right? So I want the countywide data on youth dropping out of school um, and, and drill down, or if you serve a city or if you serve even just a, 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 a neighborhood in a city, you can drill down to get this information really local. And I'm gonna show you some, um, some resources to do that. 
um, making sure that your, your data is, you know, up to date and you're telling the funder where you got your information is really critical. Um, and that you, you know, I like to kind of pull on the heartstrings as well as, you know, the information that a funder needs. So I might have, you know, some, some statistics and data, which you're going to want to have with this needs statement of really talking about what your target population is challenged with. Um, but then I might weave in that soft story to kind of start to connect people to a, you know, just a bit more human element and, and start to take that data and make it kind of come to life in the narrative so that they're also kind of, their heartstrings are a little touched and pulled in addition to them having the data that they need to really see that there's a problem. Um, so again, I'm not gonna read all of these. You can come back and, and look at that, but you know, when those data sources are really out of date, or just not relevant to the project. Um, that's also, you know, very confusing for the reader. So you want to make sure that whatever you're putting in the application as part of the need is part of what you are actually addressing in your projects and programs in your organization. Okay. Um, and then, you know, sources not cited, that's a real weakness um, on a reviewer. Um, aspect, you know, that that if I didn't see a, a source when I was grant reviewing, then I kind of just kind of disregarded it. Um, again, here you can see I'm calling it a needs or a problem statement, and another funder might call it the need for assistance or the situation analysis or community problems or community opportunities. Again, all these little uh, also known as words that you can come back to and realize that, you know, funders are usually asking for what it is you're addressing and whatever term they're using, that's what you want to use. So let's just look at a few ways, um, again, of, of enhancing this data. Um, I'm going to show you in a few slides some way that you can really drill down to the local level using the census information. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, I already talked about the information just being relevant. Again, just, you know, if, again, if you were serving those uh, students dropping out of school and that's the problem and that's what you're addressing, you know, putting information in about, um, you know, uh, veterans that, um, you know, are, are unhoused just doesn't make sense. It's just like, why did you put that information in there? It doesn't, I'm not addressing the needs of those veterans, right? So just make sure that those, those, uh, demographics that you pick are really telling your story about what you're addressing. Um, for up to date, I also kind of my rule of thumb was always three years. If the data was older than three years, then I wanted to get up to more up to date information. So that was kind of my rule of thumb. Um, and again, with more sources coming out online and, um, you know, the interactive databases that we have now with data, um, that's way easier than it was uh, 10, 15 years ago. I talked about citing your sources. Um, and then again, uh, if I had the opportunity to use a visual of uh, a pie graph or a chart or something, and I could compare, you know, my local data to my state data to my national data, and then really demonstrate, hey, we've got a bigger problem here than the state has or the nation has. I always use visuals as a way to just help the reader understand what it was I was addressing. So as more applications go online, we have less of a chance of that, but whenever I could and it made sense, I would use visuals to show that data, make that data come to life. Um, GrantStation does have a free resource called the Pathfinder. Pathfinder, it's under our, um, our public resources tab on our website. And you can find uh, for free, look at information on different data sources. You can look for information on grant writing, grant seeking, grants management, fundraising, all those sorts of things. Um, and that's just a free source that you can use um, if you're not, if you are or are not a member of GrantStation. So um, it's a really good, good database. So I wanted to share with you just a little bit of information on the um, um, American Community Survey. And I used to kind of hesitate to share this information, not because the data wasn't good, but because this, the, the interface was really kind of challenging to work with. 
And so, you know, it was just hard to teach. How do you pull this information out? And recently, the Census Bureau has really enhanced the interface with the American Community Survey. What the American Community Survey does is that it adds to the data that is collected every decade. So when I was writing one of my first grants in 1990, like nine or 98, I had to use 1990 data because that was the most recent census information that I had. Now the American Community Survey updates those different records and makes that information up to date every year. So, um, so just there's a lot of different demographics that you can get and tables and, and really work down on them. You can just see a few of them on this page. But this is again where you know you want to provide that context of your community and provide that information that tells what your target population is challenged with. So this is a great place to go to get that data. And some of the really neat interfaces that they that they've added. The first one is Quick Facts, and you can just go click on these links and and go right there. But if you live in a community that has over five thousand um, uh, population or more. Um, you can look at the county or the city or the town as long as it's 500 or 5,000 or more and dig into these different um, this different information for each individual city or county or state or whatever it is that you serve at that level. So again, just really simple. You can go in, put your location, and these tables will come up for you to then um, dissect and, and share that story. Another way is through the community profiles. I used this a lot um, uh, because what it allows you to do is to, again, I was saying earlier, you know, that, that you want your data to be local, but it can be very powerful to compare it to other data. So you can pull up information, you know, national information and, and, and statistics or your state. You can go down to the county. You can go, if you just serve a, you know, a, a, a neighborhood, you can go and look at a zip code. You can drill all the way down to a block, um, a block group or a um, census tract. Um, and that was always, you know, again, very powerful because sometimes if I was serving or my organization was serving one neighborhood in, in one city, the city data made it look like it wasn't as much of a problem but when you just pulled out certain areas in the city through the census um, through the census tracts, um, then you know you, the story was really different, right? And and that that need was really elevated. Um, so again, you can go and go to this site and pull up information on all of these different topics that you see here to make those comparisons and tell your story. And then the last way that I'm just going to share with you here is just they've kind of incorporated this, you know, kind of more AI type format of you can just go into this and type in, you know, I'm searching for poverty in Georgia in 2022, and it's going to bring up the data, table, data tables for poverty in Georgia in 2020. Um, so again, that's just another way that you can use the data. Um, but I really find that that it's it's. I really like the interface um, so much better than it used to be. Um, and so it's a lot easier to use. And um, again, the data is up to date. You cite your sources. It's really good information to share um, what your community is about, you know, what, what, what it, providing that context of your community and then talking about your target populations. Okay, so that is our um, need section. There's usually a section, almost always, there is always a section about your approach. What are you gonna do, right? Um, and so this is where you kind of have your plan of what you're gonna do step by step. And one of the things about the approach section is it has a couple of different components, um, three different components that I'm gonna talk about. So kind of separately, but usually they're kind of all in what's called your approach, or your program description, or your methods, or your strategies, whatever term the funder is using. Um, so they're really looking to make sure that your plan is very logical. Um, you know, does it make sense that taking these steps will, you know, um, uh, achieve what you're trying to achieve? We'll talk about outcomes in a bit. 
um, you know, is it is it reasonable um, what you're proposing to do? If it's scalable, that's also something that I think you want to highlight to really be able to show that you will be able to, you know, scale up to serve others if this is something that's scalable or, you know, expand to different areas, geographic areas, those sorts of things that really makes um, your approach really strong to be able to demonstrate that. And then also just showing how much your approach builds on what else, um, the other assets of your community. So showing that you're integrating your projects um, with other organizations who are funded uh, and, and you know, incorporating their services into your services um, so that you're not duplicating services or recreating a wheel. Um, and funders really like to see that, that you're building on other assets in the community. Um, then, uh, you know, kind of again, looking at it very weak, um, you know, when it's like, I don't see how this is going to solve the problem or I don't, you know, it's not very logical. I don't understand it as a reviewer. Um, you're trying to kind of go out there and be the Lone Ranger. There's other people who have done this work in the community that you should be bringing into your projects, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so again, ways that you can really, um, you know, you can use this to evaluate what you've currently written, or if you're, you know, kind of writing fresh and anew, kind of using these things as some benchmarks to really help improve your applications. You can see down here the synonymous terms of what an approach might be called. Um, so um, again, being able to translate that. Usually within um, uh, the approach section is also information on partnerships. Again, that's a really big deal with funders so that they can see that you're you know, working with others, um, that you're really you know, taking the other um, looking at like your problem that you're trying to address, right? And really looking at what those root causes of the problems are is a great way to figure out who to partner with. Because let's say you have your data on the number of unemployed in your community and that's what you're you know, gonna be working on. Well, there could be lots of reasons for unemployment and with most of the areas that you guys are addressing, there's you know, a lot of different areas. Um, you know, it's usually not one root cause. Could be, but usually not. So by looking at those root causes, you can kind of see, well, I'm going to be providing a job training program, but I see that there's these other folks in here who are providing job transportation and daycare, um, these other groups that do that. So I want to weave, you know, their transportation services and their daycare services into my program so that my people don't have those barriers, you know, or I want to weave in people who are creating jobs in this area that I'm training people on. And I'm going to weave in their work so that we're all addressing this issue together and everyone's kind of doing their part and taking pieces of it so that collectively um, you're working on a program, you know, as a, as a larger um, entity, you know, with other people. Um, so being able to show that partnership, really show what people are bringing to the table, showing how you're really maximizing the resources that are out there. Um, lots of good um, uh, stuff comes from these partnerships and things that funders really want to see. Another part um, is um, the timeline or the work plan. Again, not this is not always asked for as in, in a, a physical format, but you do pretty often see it where they either have a, a, like a timeline that they want you to complete, uh, you know, their form, or that they just ask you to include a timeline, or, you know, again, a synonymous term would be work plan. Just what are you going to do? Um, and really being able to show that you're going to be able to get the work done. Again, being realistic in your timeframes. I've written a lot of grants where, um, you know, we get the grant and we've got to hire somebody and people have written in, you know, that in month one, we're going to hire somebody. And it's like, you know, 
it might take two months, right? Or whatever. Like there's things that is like, let's be really logical and reasonable about what we're proposing because this is what they're expecting us to do, right? Whatever we say we're going to do, that's what they expect. Um, so really being able to see, you know, the tasks you're going to complete. And then the other two things that I like to include in there are the positions of the of who's responsible to get those tasks done. So it might be a partner agency that, you know, that would be their um, uh, role is to do some of this recruitment for you, let's say. And then, um, you know, your, your uh, marketing people and you put the marketing director is going to do X, Y, Z. So having the, the position so that you know who's assigned each task and then saying that time frame of either when it will occur or when it will be finished, you know, just kind of whatever makes the most sense. Um, but again, really being able to see, okay, I can really see what you're doing. It makes sense to me. It, it makes logical sense. Um, I think you can do it. I think you can get this, this done in this time frame. And so again, just ways to enhance this approach section. Um, just uh, again, doing that root cause analysis that I was talking about earlier, where you're taking whatever area it is that you're addressing, you've got the data from the need, taking that step back, saying what, what's the root causes of, the, of this problem, um, and then being able to pull in partners or show how you're filling in gaps in what doesn't exist. Um, I do think that sometimes people really do just make assumptions that, well, everybody knows what a um, foster care agency does, or everybody knows what a, um, a, a homeless shelter does, right? And they don't put enough detail in there. And really, you want to treat each application like that blank slate and really tell them step by step how you're going to provide these services. Again, just working and showing how, you know, you're working with community partners, you're weaved into the fabric of the community and, and doing good works um, and, and really being really concrete about what each partner is going to provide. So really showing who they are, what is their role in this project so that the funder or the reviewer knows exactly who's going to be doing what and when. Okay, that is our approach section. So that one had a few a few different components that are usually part of that approach. So now we're going to look at um, goals and objectives. Um, just uh, I think this is one of the parts that's that's maybe the most confusing for us as we're doing different things. Um, I could also use the term outcomes and indicators instead of goals and objectives. You'll find that some funders will just use um, questions like, how do you define success? Or what are your results going to be? Um, those kinds of things, which is all around, you know, these goals and objectives or these outcomes and indicators, right? So really, usually your goals or your outcomes are usually those kind of more visionary, how you see people changing over time. And then those objectives go in or those indicators, they then help you decide what you're going to actually measure. You know, what are those concrete measurable um, things that you can actually go out there and observe or record or see or demonstrate? Um, so usually there's, you know, those two kind of components, the, the visionary, how will people change? and then the um, more defined objectives or indicators saying, how are you going to measure that change? Um, that also being said with your goals and objectives or your outcomes and indicators, you also wanna make sure that as you're writing that need statement, whatever you're talking about the need and this and that, that then when you're writing that need statement, that's the here and now, that's the baseline data of what's going on here and now. Right. By the time you move over to these these goals and objectives or outcomes and indicators, you are starting to say what you want to see change. So how that problem will start to be addressed. Right. So the better that you connect these to the need. So it's very seamless. It's like here I told you what the problem is. 
And I told you what we're trying to change over time in our projects or programs or organizations. Um, so um, again, that you can see the, the uh, good to bad on this. Um, and when they're just really unclear or really, um, you know, not concrete or specific and measurable and achievable, um, all those kinds of things, that's when the funder starts to go, well, you know, this, this is the change that I'm paying for right here, right? This is kind of what I'm paying for to see this change. And so you really want to make sure that you're very clear about that. Another thing just for kind of synonymous terms that I just want to also share with you, you, you might hear words like a process evaluation and then an outcome evaluation. And those might be words that your funders use. Usually your process evaluation, that's measuring your activities, that's measuring what you do, how much of it you do, the duration of how long your services are, how many hours of counseling you're providing or, or um, how much uh, you know, information or resources you're providing to people, those kinds of things. And then your outcome evaluation is then that how do people change? So if you see those two um, in, a, in a funders, you know, an outcome and a process, those are, those are the differences between those two kinds of evaluations. Um, so it really is important to set up that system of how you're gonna measure those changes over time. Uh, we do a lot of uh, workshops at Grand Station about developing what's called a logic model, which is part of this process um, of, of determining how we're going to see people change over time. Um, and so you really want to have that measurement in place because you're going to you're going to have to report it at the end of the grant cycle anyway. But that's how you're telling your story about your organizational background by having that information and being able to say this is the difference we make in people's lives. These are the things that we've changed. This is how people have improved. This is how the community has you know, gotten better, whatever it is. So you have to have that system in place. And so if you don't, I really encourage you to start doing that. And then that second one there, I've already actually talked about of, of making sure that you tie the change right to that need that you are addressing. I would find a lot of times in an application I was writing, I would, you know, the, the goals and objectives or the outcomes and indicators would change as we were kind of writing this and figuring out what we could measure and what we couldn't. And so sometimes I would have like this need section already written, but then I'd have to go back because as we changed those goals and objectives, I had to kind of frame up my need a little bit differently. Um, so just making sure that those are tied together and um, really, you know, so it's just really crystal clear to the to the funder. This is the problem that we're addressing. This is what we're going, you know, this is what we want to see changed. Then your approach section is going to talk about how you're going to do it. Okay, so kind of looking at evaluation. Um, so this is really when, you know, you're looking at then, you know, we kind of talked about goals and objectives. Um, but this is where you start to really provide the information around how you're going to collect the data, how you're going to use the data um, to improve your services or um, to advertise to new target populations, potentially, or to help your organization decide strategically what initiatives you should be pouring money into and what's, what initiatives maybe aren't achieving what you want them to achieve. Um, so there's lots of great ways to use your evaluation data, and it's only valuable if you use it. So, you know, kind of talking about how this data will be used um, and what that process is as to how you're going to collect it. When is it going to be collected? Who is going to collect it? Um, if you have information that, that needs to be kept confidential, you know, what's your process for keeping that, you know, getting informed consent or keeping your, your information in locked file cabinets or on password protected computers, you know, all those kinds of things that you might have to think about if you're getting um, information that could identify a participant. So again, the evaluation section is usually then how are you going to measure, you know, those, those different um, objectives 
um, or indicators? How are you going to measure your process, um, which, you know, is what you do? So usually those things come from your own records, you know, that you keep track of uh, sign-in sheets of how many people attended this or that, or you um, have logs of information or um, uh, registration forms or enrollment forms, those kinds of things. Um, again, you can see here lots of different terms that mean the same thing. Um, and, you know, you might see formative and summative evaluation as one they used to use in education a lot. Um, then process and outcome, I already talked about that. Or they might just say, what's your assessment going to look like? Or what's your measurement about? Um, or what results are you going to um, get? Those kinds of things. So again, those that terminology does get a little confusing. Um, so it's always really important to kind of figure out how the funder is using this these words um, so that you're answering the questions appropriately. Um, so ways to enhance this. Um, again, you know, we've already talked about that, how we're going to set up that system to do that outcome measurement, um, which is, you know, not every organization does it. Not every funder requests it either. I mean, most do, but not all do. Um, so, you know, really looking at what, you know, what level of, of evaluation that they're looking at and what you can kind of, again, pre-prepare yourself to do um, so that you're always able to, to tell that story about your organization and the difference that you make. And this is where it comes from. This is where that information comes from. Um, and then again, just really being able to show that that you're going to collect this information and that you're going to use it. Um, collecting it just to collect it and write a report and set it in a in a file cabinet doesn't do anybody any good, right? If it's not being used, so um, those are just some ways to enhance that. I also want to say that um, you know when we look at those goals and objectives, or outcomes and indicators or we're looking at evaluation. You can also just go out there and Google, you know, logic models for whatever it is you do, domestic violence programs, logic models for um, uh, 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 housing programs, logic models for whatever it is you do, feeding programs, whatever. And you're gonna find how other people um, through that logic model, you're going to see they're going to use terms like what our outcomes are and what our indicators are and how we're going to measure it, right? So you can get ideas from other people and see what might work for your organization, or maybe you could tweak um, the way they do it to fit your organization or your projects better. Um, but you don't have to start from scratch. And then also one thing that's really cool that I've used a lot of since it's come out is ChatGPT. And ChatGPT does a great job of really using the correct terms that, that like a funder would be looking for. So again, you could say, create me, you could say, create me a logic model or create me an outcome measurement system um, for a job training program. And you could upload information about your job training program, right? What the major activities are, what do you do, that kind of thing. And it will spit out ideas that you can then again look at, see if they make sense to your organization, see if you can adapt them or change them to better, you know, align with your programs and projects. Um, but the, it, I, I'm really impressed because those those chatbots are actually using the correct terms. And even sometimes funders don't use the correct terms, um, to be honest. So like, I'm really impressed with how that system, it can just generate some ideas for you that you've never thought of, um, those kinds of things. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, all right, so we got just two sections left and then we will start to um, wrap up for questions. Um, but the budget and budget narrative. So your budget, um, you know, is where you kind of have just the numbers, right? And your budget narrative is where you explain those numbers. So your budget narrative tells how you calculated the amounts um, that you requested in your budget form. And the budget narrative really provides all the context of that budget form. 
Um, and a lot of uh, reviewers and a lot of funders, they first go to the budget narrative and they read that first before they read your application because they're saying all the things that you're asking money for. Um, and so then as they're reading that application, they're looking for those things, right? So in your approach section, whatever you ask for in your budget, you wanna make sure that you're describing how that's gonna play out in your approach. Um, and what would happen a lot with me was that my clients would give me the budget like the day before the grant was due. And then I would like, then they would add in something in the budget for like a, a, an evaluation, um, a software system or something to collect data or, you know, a, a consultant to do X, Y, Z. And it was like, I didn't, I didn't know they were going to ask for that in the budget. We never talked about it. Right. And so I would have to go back to the approach and say, all right, so, you know, we're, we're adding a, you know, um, here's what this consultant's going to do and how it's going to help support our project and programs. And here's what this software system is going to help us do. Um, so making sure that your approach and your budget are completely aligned and mirror one another. Um, and that in that budget narrative, again, what you're doing is providing that calculation so they can figure out how um, it was, how you came up with the number. And then if there's any justifications that you need to make of maybe something that um, is more expensive, right, then, then uh, maybe the average person would think it is, um, you know, do you really have to have a Tesla truck when a Ford, you know, F-150 would work, right? You're going to have to justify that to me as to why you want to pay that much money for a Tesla truck. Um, it's just, you know, that's part of this justification. So, you know, again, that's this is your chance to make those those, um, you know, reasons why, you know, we have to pay people at this rate or we have something that's, you know, more expensive. This is your time in that budget narrative to um, justify that information. Um, so, again, that's where, you know, people are asked to look at those budgets as a logical person. Do you need it? Is it does it make sense, you know, for the cost, all those sorts of things. All right, so our last section is sustainability, which is always the hardest question to ever answer in a grant application, right? Um, and so, you know, what funders very often ask is, you know, how are you going to sustain your projects? Um, you know, some programs have really great sustainability, right? Like, uh, oh, we asked a funder for a kitchen and then we're gonna train people to use the kitchen and then they're gonna make meals for people and that's gonna sustain the program. And so it's great, you know, I just needed that equipment. I'm good to go after that, it will sustain itself. Great. Some of our other things that we do, to be really honest, we're gonna always gonna have to go out and find money for it, right? I mean, we're not gonna, not need food for a food pantry next year, we're going to have to go raise that money. Um, and so the things that I like to talk about in that sustainability is kind of going back to your organization and the strengths of your organization and your maybe the strengths of your planning or the strengths of your leadership and how your organization will continue it will continue to meet community needs. It will continue to adapt to community needs, but how um, that organization will stay strong um, and, and kind of go more into that overall organization kind of strengths than the project or program, because it might just be the answer. We're still going to have to write more grants, but if I can show that the organization's going to keep going, the project's going to keep going, um, that's what a funder wants to see. Um, so I think I kind of answered that. I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, and then we did have one more, um, and it's just on your writing style. Again, you can kind of come back to this, but it is really important, I think, to, to tell your story in the best way, um, that you need to have, you know, again, have things set up logically, write in a really easy to understand way, um, create each application like a fresh um, a fresh opportunity to educate people about what you do and what you, you know, what area you address and what's go, what you do and what you change. Um, chat GPT and those other things are also great at just helping you prove 
uh, your your content and making sure that it's error free in um, you know grammatical issues and punctuation and things like that. That's another great use of those chat bots. Um, so, you know, the kind of at the end, you can come back, you can look at these different, you know, kinds of styles of writing, just to make sure that everything is really clear. Um, and that um, you've, you, you know, educated them about, again, all the important components of an application. Um, so those are different ways you can do that. So this actually takes us to the end. And so I'm going to take a drink of water and we do still have good. I got 10 minutes left to do some questions and answers. It's like you it's planned like, this. It's like this was I know, perfectly right? timed just so we could do questions and answer them. There's been some really great comments, really great questions that have come in. I'm going to read this for you, Alice. Don't let your head get too big. She is mm -hmm. so good. Though I am very experienced. These reminders of detail are so valuable. Very well presented without gimmicks. Alice, you are known as Alice No Gimmicks Run Key. That's your name. <laughs> the Taylor Swift of the grant writing world. <laughs> That's exactly it. Uh, economies blow up when Alice is around. It's fantastic. <laughs> Speaking of chat GPT, let's go ahead and, and start tackling these questions that come in. And again, best way to ask okay. them, put them into the Q&A. We'll try to get to them. We probably won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best to get through them. Can chat GPT write a budget narrative for me? Ooh, I probably would not put that as my favorite part of using ChatGPT um, because it is so, you know, how you calculated the information, you're going to have to put that calculation in there, you know, um, how, uh, you know, what those justifications justifications are, are going to be kind of specific to your organization and why you need this or, you know, what people are going to do or why people need cell phones because they're out in the field and da, 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 da. So I don't like chat GPT for that task necessarily as one of my, I don't think that would be its strength. Got it. Yeah. How is it different when you're looking at, let's say, art grants? I'm sure this is a common question that comes up when an outcome is more like an output, how, how do yep. you sort of show those things? Yep. And so Jessica, you're exactly right that, that sometimes with our projects or if we have short-term projects, you know, that we're not going to have longer term outcomes. And so some of our activities really do look more like outputs. They look more about counting how many people we serve and how many hours of service and all those different components. Um, but one thing that I like to do with like arts grants um, before I would start one is start to like Google or ChatGPT or whatever, get some information, right, about what the benefits are of my type of art program. So let's say it's a community festival. So what are the benefits of a community festival? Right. And then find the research that shows, well, one of the benefits is economic development and one of the benefits is a sense of place. And another benefit is being able to walk around in healthy environments, you know, or whatever. And so then I will start to see if I can tie an evaluation part to any of that. Can I tie a bit of economic development that goes on with my my arts festival? Can I tie in um feedback from people about it being a, a healthy place to, um, you know, uh, connect with others in the community, those kinds of things. So with arts, that's, that's my trick is to go, what are the benefits of a dance program? And then see if I can then start to weave in that those outcomes being tied to those benefits, if I can, you know, work it into my, into my evaluation. This next question from Dr. Joe is one that I, I've heard a couple of times, and it might just be good to to revisit this idea. To what extent is citing similar programs that you're doing that are sort of the same programs in your area? How how much does that help or hurt your grant application so that grantors can really feel they need to fund your project or not? So if someone else is doing something. Um, should I be mentioning that or should I be saying there's no one doing it? I think that I think that. Um... There, there's a couple of ways you could use this information. You could show that, you know, somebody else is doing this same service 
Um, they serve this part of the community or this side of the county, and we serve this part of the county, right? So there's like a, a you know, and we collaborate and refer people to each other, you know, show again the strengths of how you work together or, you know, do anything together. Um, you know, or it could be, um, you know, not just two different parts of a county, but it could be, you know, that that somebody is providing one part of a service and then you take over at this level. So I think just showing, showing that you're not duplicating and showing kind of where those similarities are, but then those differences, right? Like how you are providing something unique to either your target population or your community or whatever, and that you're not duplicating services. So that's that's the part that's going to make that strengthen in your application. How reliable is the census data as a source for putting together this info you're talking about? In my opinion, I think it's because it's the government. It's pretty, pretty reliable, but it, I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah, I mean, I don't know any information about like what the, you know, um, methodology or the statistically significant kinds of things. But uh, when you're out there using like the census that every everybody is going to take that information as um, a very, very um, valuable uh, committed funding source or I mean um, data source. So nobody's going to shake their head and go, eh. You know, I don't think it's so good. I don't um, trust that census. Anymore. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's very highly respected. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think so. This question came up a couple times um, in the chat and also in the Q&A. Is there a specific format that's maybe recommended for citing sources? Yeah, so usually not. Um, so usually when you're writing a... Um, let's say to a foundation or a United Way or, you know, a local company, you can usually just say right in the narrative, right? According to the U.S. Census Bureau 2022, you know, and then put your data there. As you kind of go up the food chain of grants and you're writing maybe for a state or a federal grant, they might ask for a more formal um, size, uh, sources cited page. And so I've only written one grant where it was asked, like, do it in MLA format. And that was a Department of Education one here in, in, in my state. Um, so if they do, which again, I've only seen one, but if they do, then use it, right? Because if you don't, you can get points deducted. And then my other recommendation would just be pick one. If they don't have, you know, don't tell you what to do, just pick one and use it consistently throughout your, your application so that it's just the same every time. This one's from Claudia from way back in the beginning, but I think it's a really good one to address. How do you show past success if it's a new initiative? Yeah, so that goes back to that, you know, that background section, right? And so I think that um, you want to at least show to the, the foundation that you have had some success with um, you know, the, the target population, or, you know, even if like, you're going, okay, I've, I've done, um, I've done all of this, uh, financial literacy work and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm reaching out to now do credit recovery. Um, I'm kind of making this up and you can tell, but, you know, and so I'm expanding out. So just kind of showing that, Hey, we do have this solid background of providing this. We're now adding another layer or another service or another initiative on. But if you can prove that, you know, you've you've worked with the target population on other similar things or you've um, worked in one community and you're expanding to another community, you can show, you know, that use the data from the other community. Um, so, you know, just, you know, it, it's something that you want to do um you know, show as much as you can. Um, and then, and then if you really don't have it, I would, you know, if you're really like, I'm just starting anew, um, I would talk to the funder before I would do an entire application. Just you to know, make just sure to you're see. not wasting your time kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Nope. That's, yeah. that's really great advice. And it looks like we are at the top of the hour. I wish we could go longer. As always, Alice has 
so much information, it's it's insane. And that's why we offer so many webinars at Grand Station that are also insane. Webinars aren't insane, they're fantastic, but we have so many to choose from, which have covered questions that I've seen in the chat, such as AI, what are the best ways to get together when you're a new organization? How do you collaborate with others? And also there's a lot of questions I'm noticing here, Aretha, about membership to Grand Station. What do you get with Grand Station? What are the offers? Don't we have a webinar coming up that covers some of those? for TechSoup. Am I right? Am I wrong, Aretha? I'm not sure. You are so right. You are so right. So make sure you sign up for that webinar. I'm going to put the link here. But if we sign off before I put the link, just go to TechSoup.org and you'll see where to sign up. It's called like Tool Talk, I think is the name of it. Oh, no, it's right? all aboard. It's all aboard. Oh, it's all aboard. Okay. All okay. Aboard. Sorry. Yeah. You're right. It's all aboard. And and Jeremy and uh, our, our other research research staff are going to take you through the website so you can see it and see if um, this ninety nine dollars is a good investment, which it is. It's a very so, good, but investment. you'll be able to see it for yourself. We're a little biased, but definitely join us for a free webinar, only an hour of your time. And again, any questions that you ever come up, of course, you can email Alice directly. I can't control that, so you can ask her any questions you want. But if you have any specific questions about Grand Station always feel free to email us or call us but info at grandstation.com we're more than happy to help you out with that aretha i'll hand it back to you this was great all the hearts and the hand claps the i know i love time. it i love that that's so fun i'll see you guys at grant station next week and uh, everybody else on another webinar bye-bye everybody all right. thanks everybody bye, have a everyone. good day